Dr. Hofer, welcome. I really appreciate you joining me for this conversation. Um, this is for professionalism and, in social work and student success class, and we're discussing professionalism and advocacy. And I couldn't think of a better person to talk about this with us. And so thank you for being here today. I'm going to take a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Um, let me take just a moment and introduce you formally. Dr. Rick Hofer is a scholar practitioner in the area of advocacy. His text, Advocacy Practice for Social Justice, is already in its fourth edition, with the fifth edition revisions underway. Congratulations on that. Um, he has also authored or co-authored 10 other books about macro social, social work practice and social policy, and over 100 journal articles and conference presentations. Dr. Hofer has also been the president of the NASW Texas Political Action for Candidate Election, or TPAS, twice, leading it to unprecedented successes in Texas candidate support. He was the leader of a neighborhood organization that successfully blocked the construction of a gas station in his neighborhood, so definitely has some um, good practical experience in successful advocacy. As an instructor, he has been given the Social School of Social Works highest teaching honor, the Torgerson Award, twice, and receives high marks for innovation in teaching, particularly online. He has developed the School of Social Works course on advocacy, which he and others have taught to hundreds of students over the past 30 years. So with that, welcome to this talk. And um, I just want to get started and ask you a little bit of it's, it's a, a pleasure to, to do this. I haven't uh, taught the course on advocacy for uh, about three or four semesters now. And uh, this has really helped me uh, think about things that aren't in the book yet, but will be added to the next edition because I, I'm in the midst of writing this uh, even as we speak. So it's... Well, I it's appreciate good. that. And it'll be yeah. nice for the students in this class to know they had a part in developing that fifth edition. So thank you for asking me to participate. Well, you're welcome. Can you just start out and tell us a little bit about the whole spectrum of advocacy that social workers can participate in and what that might look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Advocacy in social work is um, it's everywhere. I mean, let's, let's go back to what advocacy means. Uh, it, it means that you are using your professional skills to make an effort to change policy or change decisions that have been made or could be made. Uh, or sometimes you're trying to block somebody else's ideas because you think that they're not good for clients or, or just a, or bad ideas. So advocacy really just means that you are protecting uh, client rights, you're trying to seek social justice. And for me, as a social worker, that is the, the key hallmark of social work advocacy, is that the ultimate goal is always social justice. Th there are other professions that do advocacy, like lawyers, and they're supposed to be on the side of truth, but really, as they see it, they're on the side of their client. And sometimes that involves not so savory tactics, but in, in social work, our ultimate goal to being professional as an advocate is to keep the client's best interest in mind in, in a general sense. Thanks for that. I think you kind of brought up when you talk about attorneys and how they are also advocates. It's kind of interesting to me because I know there's some attorney, attorneys out there um, like um, Bobby Kennedy Jr., who is an environmental attorney and may advocate for the planet or something like that. But in a lot of cases, I think we think about attorneys advocating for a client in a specific situation. And as social workers, we do that too. So do you see some kind of um, differentiation or way to look at advocacy for one client in a direct practice situation versus advocacy for social justice more broadly? I think that we, if, if we are arguing and advocating for social justice for an individual client, that's the same thing as doing it for millions of people or for some other 
entity because if we don't have social justice for one, we really don't have social justice for all. So, um, and th there's sometimes a distinction made between case advocacy and cause advocacy. And, and so that would be like at the individual level is a case level and you don't expect anything to go beyond that from that one client. But other uh, cause advocacy is, is much more about making changes in policies and laws that impact large numbers of people. And as social workers, both of those are important to us. Exactly. And if we, we may not know it, but when we advocate for one, it may turn into a cause. Mm -hmm. And it may impact, like, you know, there's, if, if we look just, for example, at issues around Black Lives Matters and police interactions and things like that, it, it could start off in, in an area where, well, look, this one guy has been tased or killed by police uh, in an unjust manner. And yes, that's true. And, and there's been many, many killings in the last couple of years. And that ignited a large scale causal kind of advocacy. Mm -hmm. So it did, I, I don't see like a hard and fast distinction in fact, that's what is is like the the thing about my book that was new and different and has stood the test of time is I say, forget the cause versus case, because that's not really a true dichotomy. Uh, we use the same generalist approach to solving problems with advocacy as we do any other aspect of uh, social work practice. Well, so that kind of leads me to my next question, because if we're looking at advocacy can apply to everybody, it doesn't matter if you're in macro practice, you're working with communities or organizations or individuals, it's it's something that everyone is going to be engaged in. Mm -hmm. Then um, what would you like? How do you define professionalism specifically related to advocacy? Or do you define professionalism specifically related to advocacy maybe well, I, 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 I think that's where my mind was going uh was like well if, <laughs> what, what if, if if you take as a basis for advocacy that it's for client and and general social justice mm, you know professionalism is professionalism and i i think sometimes um, professionalism, and I don't, I, I'm, I haven't been in your class. I don't know how you approach this, but to me, sometimes professionalism is a word that's used to beat down people mm -hmm. who are acting out of the norm. But as social workers, like uh, sometimes you have to act outside of the norm because the norm is racist, the norm is sexist. The norm has all sorts of structural barriers to social justice. And the normal thing is that, well, we'll just, there's nothing we can do about it. Social workers have to reject that idea that there's nothing we can do about it. We are called in our code of ethics to do something about it. And in, in the, the, the regulations that cover social work educational programs, one of the key competencies that social work students are supposed to emerge with is uh, understanding of policy practice, which is wh where advocacy falls under. And, and, and what, there's a lot of other things, in, including understanding the structural problems of society. But we're not just left to be able to say, oh, well, yeah, that's too bad. It, it exists, but what are we supposed to do with that? Right. We are supposed to do something about it. Well, okay. So let's say we are doing something about it. We're showing up with our best social work advocacy skills, and we're really working hard um, to see some change. We're working hard for some sort of social justice cause. Mm -hmm. And we start getting beaten down by, because we're not, quote unquote, being professional. You know, you're being whatever that looks like, argumentative, or you're being too sensitive, or you are not advocating appropriately within the right channels. Like, how does a social worker navigate that? 
Social workers are trained, I think, in every aspect of practice to overcome barriers. Now, the barriers may look different, just like, you know, you, you, you don't necessarily use the same uh, counseling techniques with everybody. We know that different uh, kinds of issues at the individual level require different kinds of interventions. And so if we think of advocacy as a, just a different kind of intervention approach, then like um, it doesn't seem to me that we have to think, oh, well, what's different about advocacy? Mm -hmm. That's I, I keep returning to this because that was the, the before I wrote my the first edition of the advocacy book, everyone was just chopping things up into separate piles. Like, oh, legislative advocacy is different than advocacy in the bureaucracy or in the courts. I, I, and so I, I roundly reject that. <laughs> And as uh, you may hear that many times, but what do we do when it happens to us? We organize, we create allies, we get other people on our side, but we don't give up and we don't just say, gosh, they must be right. There's, there's an element of persuasion and policy that's called framing. And we do this at, at all levels as social workers with individual clients. And, but whoever controls how the problem is defined is going to win. So if you are, and like I've had this happen to me, but let's just be more general. Whenever someone says, oh, you're being unprofessional, they're trying to put a frame around you. I'd like to say they're framing you. Mm -hmm. And you have to just be able to say, no, that's not the right definition of the problem. The problem is not that I'm talking too loud. The problem is not that you think I'm being disrespectful. The problem is the problem, which is you're not treating people fairly. And so if, if you can do that, that's all it takes. I mean, you, you, you ask, what are what if you're getting beaten down? What if you're being fired? What if you're being denied promotions? That's definitely an issue. And when we're all afraid of that happening. Um, I, I was reading a book recently by Sarah Ahmed called Complaint. And it says that whenever a person complains, things happen. First, people make fun of you or they disagree with you. And then... When they dislike you, they begin taking avenues of, of support away from you, and you become isolated. So how do you combat being isolated? Well, you, you find allies. If there are no allies, then you have to consider very clearly if perhaps this organization you're working with is, is not one that you want to maintain your connection with. Mm-hmm. There, there was, um, I'll, I'll tell a little public administration story here that I, I learned when I when I taught at a public administration program. A, a new city manager comes in, the old city manager hands him three envelopes and says, open these one at a time whenever you have a huge issue and, and you're afraid you're about to be fired. So this happens the first time. Picks up the envelope and it, says blame the previous occupant of the office <laughs> and and so he did that and and he he got by that crisis second crisis comes along opens up the envelope it says blame circumstances beyond your control so i did that okay survived two crises third crisis comes along picks up the third envelope opens it up he reads it Prepare three envelopes. <laughs> so, so there's no job that's so important that you can't leave it. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's a, I love the story. It's super funny, but I think it also, the first two things is just a way of trying to reframe, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. It's not me. I'm going to take it back to professionalism since that's what we're talking about. It's not me and it's professionalism. It's what circumstances I inherited. Yeah. Right. 
or it's these other circumstances, like you say, pointing it. And I honestly, I love that piece of advice, like really recognizing when you're in a situation where others are weaponizing the term professionalism to mm-hmm. really be able to flip that script and say, you know, it's not me, it is. And so maybe it's the classism that says I should wear a particular type of clothes or wait, maybe it's racism that says my hair shouldn't look this way or something, but it's not me. It's the system. It's the, Mm -hmm. um, it's the context. It's the setting or whatever it may be. Right. I think that's just super good advice. And it's amazing how many times people who are in power don't have good reasons for what they're saying. Mm Mm-hmm. Or, or the policies that they're promoting. It's just, well, as one colleague put it, when I question some decision, like, do you have any evidence that this will work? Well, no, we just thought it was a good idea. Well, <laughs> I happen to think it's not a good idea. <laughs> but what do you think about that? And, you know, they, the, the, the people at the top can use just raw power and overcome you, but... Again, if you're organized, if you if if you create allies, it's possible to sometimes stop bad ideas, or or you can reframe it and say, well, that's not necessarily a bad idea. I I understand where you're going with that. I understand you want to improve things, but look, there's other ways to do that. Mm-hmm. And before we just adopt this one thing that you thought would be a good idea. Why don't we do a little research or why don't we try to to figure out another way that could reach us towards that same goal? It sounds as if, I mean, even just when you're talking about how you might be working against people in power, systems of power, um, it sounds like you're bringing a lot of curiosity to the approach what if we tried this? What if we get, got more information? How do we know that this is going to work? Does that feel like um, a power, a, a tool that works, a good approach? We know that that sometimes people get into their own little bubbles and they have their their own compadres around them, and everyone just wants to say, "Oh, that sounds like a good idea," or, or whatever. But um, if if you can just like puncture that bubble a little bit, sometimes they're open to mm-hmm. a different thing, especially if you have an audience, like at, at a larger meeting, you could, you know, maybe get someone that you wouldn't necessarily approach and just would say, oh, well, you know, that person's got a point. Um, so I'm, I'm reading uh, another book called, and I just love the title, uh, something along the lines of the importance of being a troublemaker. And in this, the the research, it's fascinating research that says when there's consensus, it's hard to to break that bubble. Mm -hmm. But if just one person says, wait, just let's stop, you know, and punctures that consensus, even if they don't win that particular battle, it forces everyone else to make a decision. Do we want to like try to think about this a little more? The trouble with consensus is if, if someone comes in and says, oh, well, I was at a meeting and everyone agreed that this was a great idea and it's coming to a larger group. And uh, like, who wants to go against the consensus? Yeah. Everyone should at least be forced to think that there's another approach. So I'm I'm envisioning me or a social worker maybe showing up at a town hall meeting or showing up at a legislative hearing to mm-hmm. advocate for something. And this idea of um, maybe there's already a consensus formed and you're going to be the one voice who's speaking out you've talked about having allies and bringing allies. So I can imagine one scenario where you bring your team and a bunch of you from the neighborhood show up and you're, I'm just putting myself in your shoes. Like we don't want this gas station, right? whatever it may be, but there may be times where you're feel like you're alone in a room full of people who are completely, you know, 
in disagreement. And yeah. we may be talking about your brand new social worker, or you just don't like speaking up in big groups, or you don't have a lot of practice, or imposter syndrome is just raining down on you in this moment. Like, who am I to speak about this topic when I don't know? I'm not an expert or whatever. So how do you, like, what would you say in that situation? Like, how do you as maybe the sole person who doesn't have the allies to give you the courage in that moment, how do you kind of, you know, begin to speak when it's hard to speak? I think that there are many different tactics and, um, but it, it comes down to how professional do you want to be? Where, what is the source of professionalism other than knowledge? about the, a situation and a desire to see a just outcome. Um, you know, that would, if, you, if you have that, then you've come a long way. But there, there are other like more really practical tips. Like you don't necessarily stand up and, and you know, cause a, a big scene, but you may have to, and, and I've done it, but you know, it's not comfortable. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there's just like verbal jujitsu that you can do. And you can start off saying, especially if you're new, being new is like great because you can say, well, I'm new around here and I don't quite understand this. Could someone explain how that is in line with our mission statement that says we're going to do X, Y, and Z? Because to me, it seems like it's not. So who can explain that to me? And so you don't have to be confrontational, but you can you can revert back to your reframing by saying, this seems like a, a decision that is being made mm, that's counter to our mission, that's counter to our stated values. And as a new person, you can get away with that sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, more so than, than someone who's got all this history with the other people in the room. And so it's amazing how, how often you can actually find an ally by just asking seemingly innocuous uh, questions. So that's one you know concrete tip to, to address your, your situation. Now, what happens if you're not that new person? How, how do you stand up? Well, you've, you've, in any organization or any situation, there are relationships. And part of the job of, of any social worker is to be able to create relationships that are focused on social justice outcomes. And that could be your local um, MAGA supporting state representative, mm -hmm. or it could be your neighbor who you're having you know, some kind of discussion with. Um, and, and so social workers are really good at relationship building. That's part of our stock and trade. If everyone learns in social work 101, you know, to, to how to be empathic and how to ask the kind of questions that bring people out instead of making them go away. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to maintain every relationship for the rest of your life or that it's going to be an easy relationship. But it's it's possible to be proactive and reach out to the people who are going to be decision makers in any situation long before you need it for a particular situation. I think that's a really great point is it's not I mean, you may just find yourself in a, you know, homeowners association meeting or who knows where and mm -hmm. you haven't built those relationships. But in a lot of situations, we are going to, you know have an ability to have some forethought about mm -hmm. meeting people. And even if it's a casual relationship that you establish with someone who's, to use my example, the president of the Homeowners Association, mm -hmm. I think it does take that edge off a little if you're the lone voice for justice in a situation or lone voice, voice advocating for something, just to know, at least I know this person's name mm -hmm. and we've chit-chatted about whatever, the trees in my front yard or whatever that might be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it it makes your life richer if you have relationships with people that you don't necessarily agree with on everything. Mm -hmm. 
I will absolutely agree with that. We've been, um, so in a few, a few modules before this, we talked about, you know, what is it like when you're bridging differences in groups? And um, one of the things that you said earlier, what we in that module, there is this concept of dominance dynamics where there's certain group of people who have tended to be the dominant, or I call them the non-marginalized folks mm -hmm. in the crowd, and then others who are in a non-dominant or marginalized uh, situation, and it can sort of switch depending on setting and context. Right. It made me think about when you're that lone voice in the room and you think everybody else has a consensus, you're absolutely a non-dominant and it makes it super hard to speak out. Mm -hmm. But this, you know, we've, we have been building um, tools to overcome those differences and that speaking up and recognizing that you, in a way you're testing the assumption that there is a consensus that True. everyone agrees that you're not you you don't have the knowledge you need to have or whatnot and you're kind of breaking that you know the internalized oppression of this group mm -hmm. that as a whole unanimous right. you know wall against what I think is right um I think a lot I mean I was just really connecting what you were saying to that kind of way of understanding what it's like to be in a group mm-hmm we don't actually know what everyone else thinks, yeah. but just the fact of speaking up gives space for other people who maybe just have just been going along or not paying attention. And there, there may be a whole lot more people who are unhappy or at least questioning the consensus than you want than you might imagine. Because and once there's a consensus, no one wants to speak up against it until someone else does. And then that gives everyone the permission to think more. And that's what the research shows from this book I was saying about you know, the benefits of being a troublemaker, is that you give other people the permission to not just go along. And, and the research says maybe you don't win that day, maybe, but maybe you start a chain reaction. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you just open up the whole organization to a different thought, which bears fruit later on. I feel like just hearing that, it just makes me proud of being a social worker and proud of the field of social work. Like if that's if that's part of our mandate and that's part of our professional identity, it's a beautiful mm -hmm. thing. It is. And it's it's interesting that just because other people are social workers, doesn't mean, let's, particularly I, I, my own bias is people who ascend the power grid, or, you know, or move up the ladder, whatever you want to call it, they forget that they're not infallible. And, and oftentimes they retreat into the administrator's group. And that's very hard sometimes for them to stand out because they want to get along, they want to keep their job, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a lot of internal pressure on them as well as external pressure. So many times top leaders say, well, you know, the, the whole good to great paradigm, which says everyone's got to be on the bus. It, it doesn't leave room for the creativity of, of uh, the troublemaker. Yeah. And it's so necessary. So like I'm, I'm thinking of getting a pin that says I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> I think I love that idea. <laughs> it would be <laughs> contagious and then everybody would be the troublemaker. And then, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I've I've been I've been called that by people, but you know, it's I, I don't see it as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's someone who wants to test assumptions and to come to a better a better decision. We've been talking a lot about um advocacy within an organization. Mm -hmm. I and and in some ways maybe that because I asked the question like what happens when people are calling you unprofessional because mm -hmm. I imagine in something like a street protest you're out there holding a sign yelling on this corner chanting on the corner kind of thing you're probably not going to get someone saying oh my gosh you're just so unprofessional but it may happen in a staff meeting where you're advocating for change um, but I do think that there are you know, potentially 
fears about professionalism when you're putting yourself out there on the street corner with a sign. Like mm-hmm. what happens when the newspaper takes your picture and you're on the front page and then your supervisor sees you or your client sees you. And I don't even know necessarily what this street protest may be about. I'm just trying mm-hmm. to tease out like it's not always these concerns or these these, you know, ways in which we try to advocate aren't always within the context of the organization I'm employed by. Right, right. Good point. So professionalism extends to every aspect of a social worker's job. So if if um, it, it can happen that as you consider the alternatives for how best to achieve social justice in a particular situation, that, that you do go to the streets. And, you know, there's, there's, the older I get, the more I realize there's no shame in being arrested mm-hmm. in, in the social justice. Now, I haven't done it yet. So I'm not saying like I'm out there every day <laughs> getting my name in the papers as social work professor arrested again. But um, it, it's like you see the civil rights activists. Are they afraid of being arrested? Well, they got beat up. Yeah, you know, just being um, true to their cause, it, you you can't stop that all the time. So the question is, how much does it mean to you what your beliefs are? And there's there's so many reasons that we can think of that you know we don't want to be heard. We don't want our name in the papers. We don't want the other side to know. You know where we live. Yeah, and it, even just recently, um, I think it was uh, Sen- Senator uh, Romney who wrote a book now, and he's saying that he talked to all all of his colleagues, and they say we have to convict Trump on this, uh, you know, insurrection charge, the impeachment, and other people said, well, maybe I agree with you, but I'm afraid for my family. Mm-hmm. Because there were, there's a lot of threats of physical violence, and and you know there's there's real world consequences, and sometimes if it's just us, we could say, well, I'm I'm willing to risk it for me, but I'm not going to risk it for my kid or my family, and and so it's um, they're very complex things. So I think even as advocates who are called by the social work code of ethics. It's very difficult to be judgmental about people who decide to act differently. Yeah. Um, and that's the trouble with ethical responsibilities, you know, which which is the greater responsibility to a cause or, you know, the social justice aspect or to my own little world where I don't want people hurt. Right. I mean, it's 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 not unreasonable sometimes to fear what might happen as a result of your advocate right in in that kind of larger scale and if you have tools for ethical decision making you don't just make a knee jerk oh i'm not going to speak out or i must speak out you really do have some ways to think about it thoughtfully think about your options think about your ethical values that sort of are behind that decision and I'll put in a plug for NASW because as imperfect as, as an organization as it is, and, and they all are, it, it definitely gives us the ability to consult with other social workers at all levels, from um, the local level, people who might be our neighbors, um, even if they, they work in different organizations, they're social workers. We all have this common code of ethics. And, and you can take that from your neighbors, your local social workers, to the state level and to the national level. And there's there's actually a like a defense fund that is run by NASW that, that I've frequently donated to that will help pay the legal costs of people who are like charged for their actions, you know, that that fall in line with the NASW code of ethics. I love that. It remi- it makes, you know, this 
is a question that I'm not even sure. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how to ask, so bear with me. But it really brings to mind like the peer consultation that we can do mm-hmm. and the supervision that we can seek. Mm-hmm. Do you think that there is a specialized type of super, like, you know how you said people can make all sorts of different choices that Mm -hmm. are the ethical right choice for them in terms of, you know, how to engage with advocacy. Mm -hmm. But I see some leaders in the field who are strong advocates in many ways. And does it make sense to seek out a specialized advocacy supervision? (laughs) As compared to maybe your a different kind of supervision, like is it is it useful to have mentors and supervision supervisors who can specifically speak to issues around advocacy? That's a question I have never considered because I see advocacy as just another aspect of social work practice. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, it's clear that you can use different techniques. Like you're not going to sit down with a um, an individual client and say, "Well, let's go march," you know, or something. But you might need to do that in terms of um, you know a, a larger scale problem. Um, I, I don't think I've ever heard of anyone who is an advocacy specialist, but that might be like a a good side gig. <laughs> <laughs> you should consider it. That's right. <laughs> Um, okay, so we took a little detour, but I did want to circle back around to this idea of social workers getting arrested and talk about civil disobedience. Mm-hmm. So one of the first, I was a first semester MSW student, and I was in policy class, and there was someone who was very high up in the leadership um, in our you, you know university institution who came in to talk to us about policy. Mm -hmm. And they shared this story and it was just this story of what was happening in the city where um, there was a lot of human trafficking and sex trafficking, especially for young people who had run away from home. And the statistic was if you were and I may not be quoting this specifically, but if you were away from home on the streets for more than 24 hours, then your likelihood of being sex trafficked was just tremendous. And yet in the city, there was a prohibition for shelters or anyone taking in a person under the age of 18 without the parental written parental permission. Mm -hmm. And that that was such a barrier. So young people were staying on the streets and at risk. And I, you know, popped my hand up and I was like, well, as social workers, can't we just take them in anyway? Why can't we do civil disobedience? Why can't we break that law? Because that law is unjust. Mm -hmm. And this person, like I said, was pretty high up in the structure of the university. And I think they were pretty flummoxed by that question because I was specifically saying, let's break the law. Right. And I think that as we've discussed, that was probably very uncomfortable for that person's family, for that person's position and whatnot. Um, But yet I still tend to think I'm kind of biased towards the troublemaker button. I still think, why don't we just break the law when there's laws like that? And I don't know what I would do. And certainly without some of the supports that you've been talking about, like allies or the ways in which you maybe first advocate to change the law before you get to a place where you just are like, here's something that's entrenched and unjust and mm-hmm. what do you do? So can we talk a little bit about civil disobedience? Sure. Yeah. Well, we have so many examples of civil obe- uh, yeah, disobedience that that have led to change. Now, that doesn't mean it hasn't been costly to the people engaged in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, how many times were people beaten or attacked by dogs in the civil rights movement? or murdered, yeah. uh, the freedom buses, um, Black Lives Matter, you know, those, there were significant riots. You know, some, they, they, so I, I mean, what, what about civil disobedience? Should we ever do it? 
I think there are certainly times when upon due consideration that that may be the best way to go. And there are other times when if, if you're just doing it in the spur of the moment, it's quite possible that that's not the right decision in that moment. Right. There's, there's um, organizations that, that can be hired to come and conduct training in nonviolent civil disobedience. I mean, we, we think about the marches and, and the things from the 60s and, and the women's rights movement. The, the, the participants generally were not untrained. They didn't just show up and say, hey, I think I'll be arrested today. You know, it's like, how do you respond? You know, how do you protect your rights? Uh, how do you maintain your own personal safety in the midst of all this? So what I would like to see is NASW at a statewide conference hire these people, these trainers to come in and say, you know, we've got some bad laws and we may want to do something about it, but let's do it in a thoughtful, safer, safe as we can way. And so um, I'm a big believer in training. It's like, just imagine, like I'm, I'm a upper aged, <laughs> middle class or, or higher, depending on how we want to define that, a white guy. I've, my encounters with police have never led to some of the terrible things that many other people uh, have have encountered and i would probably be very nervous when the person said if a cop said you're under arrest mm -hmm. and and i've been doing some reading i've been watching videos about well how do you respond in this situation you, your your emotions are not like oh i'm just really zen and cool about this <laughs> you know before it happens you're going to be all riled up and you have to like just be trained and learn how to deal with the all the stresses that are going on inside your body that are saying, no, I'm not going to do that here, you know, you know, whatever. And once you resist, like you've seen the videos, people, even people who don't resist, you've seen the videos. Yeah. Some of them aren't alive anymore, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, so that that's that's my my thinking about civil disobedience. It's a tool, but it's like the most powerful like chainsaw tool mm -hmm. and you should know what you're doing. I think that you keep bringing us back to the NASW code of ethics, because I think what you're talking about is confidence. And so if yeah. it's something like, you know, in a, in the case advocacy, mm -hmm. speaking up for a client, maybe to the judicial system or something, you build your social work skills, you have knowledge mm -hmm. about the judicial system, what's going on, and you're able to confidently advocate. And so this idea that maybe if there's a spectrum of all sorts of different levels of tools, and here we are holding this chainsaw of <laughs> obedience, you have to know how to use a chainsaw. Right. And so that we really do need to, just like the Code of Ethics say, says, mm -hmm. be confident in our practice. And right. not just, you know, jump into different types of tools that we don't know how to use. Right. I mean, imagine the people who are now like experimenting with clinical uses of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't do that without a lot of training. Right. You, you might get yourself in, in and, and the client in a whole lot of trouble. Right. So I, I like the point you're making. Well, thank you. I like your point too. So, um, the another thing when we've been that we've been talking about, and I keep thinking, oh, like I want to follow up on this, so I'm just going to kind of non sequitur to to this question. Sure. Um, I think we can get pretty outraged against injustices, mm -hmm. or we can get kind of this impotent rage when we're trying to be reasonable and going up against a brick wall of resistance. Mm -hmm. People won't listen to us. They won't hear us. They won't even meet with us. And we're trying to, you know, in some way engage in a conversation. Right. And that can be infuriating. 
So yeah. when you're bringing anger or other emotions, I mean, if you want to go back to BLM, you know, grief and despair and just all of these emotions that can be part of, you know, the human experience as you try to advocate. Do mm-hmm. you have any advice for negotiating that? I guess if I use the word training, that might sound like like, but but there there is a way to train yourself to channel anger and to make it a part of yourself and your search for social justice. I think everyone who strives for social justice looks at the current system no matter what system you're in, if it's an organization, if it's, uh, you know, society at large, whatever, there's a lot of reasons to be angry. And so just like any emotion, you can use anger to propel yourself to prepare, to learn, to um, gather allies. But if everyone's just angry all the time, you you don't get that far. Mm -hmm. Anger, expressing anger at someone almost always causes them to clam up. Yeah. Now, when when I was a master's student, um, I had these two community organizer professors, and they were very active in the the town of Lawrence, you know, trying to, to do social justice things. And... Uh, one guy, his name was uh, Norm Forer, and he was a former union organizer. And so he he knew about organizing and how to you know reach across aisles when needed. But the, he he told me once I was watching him at a city council meeting, and he was raising his voice and shaking his fist. And I said, you know, Norm, what what's going on? You like is that very effective? He said, No, that's not the effective part. The effective part is when you shake your hand and your fist in their face and yell at them and they yell back. And then after the meeting, you go out and have a beer together. (laughs) So, you know, that's that relationship thing. Mm -hmm. Even if if, like, is there such a thing as fair fighting in a couple's situation? Well, yes. Is there such a thing as fair fighting in an advocacy situation? Um, I'm just thinking about this for the first time, but I think there probably is. Mm-hmm. And it's, but see, that's it. You know, when one side is willing to commit violence against their opponents, you know, that's not fair fighting, right? right. And we know that at every single level. So it it helps when there's rules of the game that everyone agrees to. And I think part of what's happened in our society, going back to the Reagan years, um, is that the, there's one side that now says, well, the rules don't apply to us. And of course, that side would say that my side is the one that's breaking the rules. But it's um, when there's a lack of a common framework, uh, it's really hard to to come to a, a conclusion. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's it, it, it's a hard deal. I'm not saying advocacy is a walk in the park. Right. Well, it might be a march in the park. <laughs> <laughs> Literally a march in the park. So you can't even, I don't know, maybe just to feel good about what you do, your anger isn't going to go away, but you've established some pre, pre-game pre rules right? for what you really find, you know, appropriate. This right. is what, this is a line I'm not going to cross, uh, you know, yeah. violence obviously is one and somebody else may cross it. I may get beaten up while, while I'm getting arrested or whatnot, but I'm not the one who's going to cross that line, no right. matter how I feel inside. It's, it's, it's interesting. And, and I, I wrote a, a journal article that appeared in, in the NASW journal of social work about the dangers of social advocacy. And when I was researching that, um, uh, that's where I learned about these organizations that will train uh, groups of people in non uh, nonviolent uh, resistance. Um, but I also came across references to how even during the civil rights era, there were marshals 
I mean, the, the, the civil rights organization appointed marshals to oversee the march. And if somebody was getting triggered or starting to act out in a violent way, the marshals from the marchers would come and separate that person and and talk to them. And, and so, again, it's having allies, having agree things within your own organization to say, if this is getting to be too much for you, you know, we're going to help you take a step back. Mm -hmm. That's another common theme is the allies. Yeah. yeah. And I can think I can reflect on my own personal experience because I can get hot headed for sure. But I've also been in situations where someone has said to me before some type of a meeting, like, I, I'm just so emotional about this right now. I don't think I can do much talking. Will you yeah. do, you know, will you present this message? And right. we can negotiate that because maybe somebody realizes they won't be the best vessel for that. Right. And, and uh, you know, the thing about preparation is it can go a long way to getting your message heard. Mm -hmm. Maybe not that moment, but again, what as troublemakers we're piercing the consensus that supports social injustice mm -hmm. it might take five minutes it might take five months it might take five years or 50 years but with consistent effort things really can change that's a good hopeful note to end I on know. i was just thinking that <laughs> I'm I'd like to write that down. It definitely. I'd like to um, post some links to the trainings that you've been talking about. And if yeah. you can think of any other good resources, we'll definitely get them online for mm -hmm. students. Um, and I guess a nice plug for people, if they're interested in developing their skills even more, read the book, take the advocacy class. Yeah. We'll post the link to the book as well. Okay. All Any right. last uh, pieces of advice or thoughts? Well, I, I want to just like first thank you for thinking of me to do this. And it is so helpful that it's coming while I am doing the preparations for the fifth edition. But also I, I want to just say, look, this conversation we had, I have ideas now I didn't have when we started. Mm -hmm. So conversation about important topics can can just be wonderful all by themselves. And um, I, I think that's a really important professional thing that people can do is to leave themselves open to having conversations. And, and that, there's a lot of thinking that goes on in the interaction. I agree. It's almost, you know, some people think you shouldn't think out loud because then you sound ridiculous at times, but I'm all about thinking out loud because until you start talking with other people, you have no way of really um, understanding how the thoughts in your head resonate on the outside. Yeah, I find I, I do my best thinking while I'm writing. And I, I always start every book I start, I think, oh, this one's going to be easier. I already know what I want to say. And then it's like, it's not easy because <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, new ideas. Indeed. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hofer. Well, thank you, Dr. Malden. You're welcome. All right.